that uh, I, dis I thought in this sermon that I would like to look forward. To look forward. Typically, we as a methodology in the way we live our lives. We live our lives on a weekly basis from Sabbath day to Sabbath day. So here we are on the Sabbath day, and we mark all year long as being from Sabbath to Sabbath. But in addition to the weekly Sabbath, I'm speaking of the weekly Sabbath there, in addition to the weekly Sabbath, we also live our lives from Holy Day to Holy Day. Having just completed the observance of the day of Pentecost, even though, as I said, at uh, Pentecost services, Pentecost is ongoing up until the time of the Feast of Trumpets. It represents a 2,000 year period of time in history from the crucifixion of Christ until the return of Christ. And there are first fruits, it's called the Feast of First Fruits in the Bible. There are first fruits that encompass all of that time. And so as the summer goes on, I planted some things I hope will become first fruits in the garden. And uh, we expect to observe those, uh, fest those first fruits as they become ready. So that's Pentecost, but now, that's, now I'm sort of looking back when I look at the day of Pentecost, I'm kind of looking over my shoulder a bit, even though it's an ongoing festival, now I want to look forward today to the next holy day. Begin to anticipate, look forward to the day of trumpets. I would say this is a topical sermon. Now, there are two types of sermons that uh, we typically give, either a topical sermon or an expository sermon. Expository sermons cast illumination on a particular section of Scripture in the Bible and focus on that section of Scripture. Topical sermons uh, relate to a subject wherever it may take you in the Bible. So this is a topical sermon. It is about, at least it, on the subject of being faithful. Being faithful, it sounds a little bit like having faith, and it is related, but being faithful is, is, is separate and distinct from having faith. Faith is defined in the Bible as believing in God and recognizing that God rewards those who diligently seek him. So it's a concept of mind that we have. Being faithful relates somewhat to the sermonette in that it means that you live what you believe as time goes on. It's more like running a distance race. So there's a distinction between those two concepts Faith, having faith, believing in God, and knowing that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It's the evidence of things not seen, as it says in the Bible. We build that evidence over time, but that's conceptually what's in our mind. Being faithful is, is more a matter of doing, living up to the things that we are committed to through our faith. This sermon, this sermon is on the subject of being faithful. I entitled it, well, here's the title that I, that I started to give, but I thought it's too long, so I'll have to shorten the title, abbreviate the title a bit. Three things in order, required in order to be judged faithful. That's what Day of Trumpets is about, isn't it? It's about being judged by Christ at his return, and we will be, if we are judged faithful, we will be in that first resurrection. I shortened it to, the, to this uh, four words, three things for faithful. And I'm going to focus on three things. I'll start out here by talking about three things, but I, I don't want you to get... Um, seduced by the fact that there's three in the initial part of the sermon. After we get a little bit further into the sermon, 
I'll tell you about the three things that are required to be faithful. <clears throat> Here's uh, the scripture. Bryant quoted a little, a bit of this scripture in that regard. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse sixteen. Just to sort of uh, focus us in a bit on the return of Christ and the scripture there and related to this sermon. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now we want to be among those who rise from the dead, or if we're still alive, as the scripture says, uh, some of you may be, I don't expect that I will be, but uh, some of you may be still ar alive uh, whenever that um, event occurs. You would be then judged as being faithful and therefore resurrected and in the first resurrection with Christ. But in order to do that, you've got to be judged as having been faithful. So I want to, as we look uh, forward to the day of trumpets, I want to consider three things that God requires of us in order to be considered faithful. Let's look at the scripture in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. This is where you'll see three things, but I'm not, these are not the focus point of the sermon, but they are important to direct us into the focus point of the sermon. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb. The Lamb shall overcome them. I won't go into all the context of that. For he, the Lord, is Lord of lords, King of kings, and they that are with him. Here's the description of what you and I want to be at the return of Christ. They are called, number one, number two, chosen, number three, faithful. So we're, we're working on getting into this part of, of being faithful and we'll, see, we'll ultimately see three things that we want to focus on so that we can be faithful. <clears throat> I thought of an analogy here that I could that I could use. Some time back, we made uh, a family trip to Virgin Gorda, which is a it was an island in the Caribbean, uh, which uh, is uh, has a unique meaning because of the shape of the island. The island Virgin Gorda is shaped like a fat woman. In Spanish, Virgin Gorda means fat woman, and so the shape of the island is like a fat woman. And we were there, and as we were there riding around, things were very beautiful there, very, very beautiful, because it's, it's, it's not really a place where a lot of people go, so nature remains uh, pretty nice there. But I had uh, gotten somewhere a set of sunglasses which had polarized lenses. And polarized lenses are created by scratching at some very close proximity, very fine scratches in the, in the medium, not glass, it's, it's plastic, I guess, from which the lenses are made. And that blocks out a substantial amount of, amount of the light. It is a filter which uh, allows certain light through and other things not through. So it is a way in which light is filtered, polarized lenses, polarized glass. And I, and I look at this as, as being sort of a filter, uh, it, it's, a, it's comparatively at least, a filter by which uh, I am analyzing this particular set of scriptures. These three make war with the Lamb. There are three filters that, that we talk about here. Those who are with him are, number one, called, number two, chosen, 
Number three, faithful. And so there's, it, the lens is, first of all, let through, this, this filtration device, lets through only those who are called. If you have not been called, you're not eligible to be in this uh, first resurrection. You are, of course, certainly and uh, to be a part of the second resurrection, but in order to be a part of the first resurrection, we must be called. And we can, maybe we often do, read these three things together, not just these three things, but things in the Bible, and not catch the distinction between the things. But there are three distinctive descriptives here about those who are with Christ. First of all, they must be called. That's the filter, the filter of the light in that way. John 6.44 tells us that. No man can. See, everything else is blocked by these, this scratching of the lenses. No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. That is to say, everything, everybody who is not at this point in time in this age called by God the Father, Christ is saying, he's, he's clearly referring to God the Father there, that God the Father must call a person in order to get them to him. If God the Father hasn't called somebody, they're not eligible at this point to get there. They're sort of blocked out by this uh, filtration device. Now the Bible does tell us, and this is a comparative only. This is a comparative only, but it is, it is, uh, it does give us uh, some, some indication. Many are called. How many? Well, many. It says but few are chosen. We don't see many sitting here, you know, but uh, we see a few sitting here. And I've been impressed over the years at how many people can have a partial understanding, can come to some level of understanding, but they don't go beyond that point. If you see the ministry of Christ, uh, Matthew 13, thousands and thousands stood on the shore and they were called. They, they were called to come and listen to what he had to say, but they never progressed beyond that point. And, and on many occasions um, that you see in his ministry, there were such crowds that were there. I think the Gospel of John, where the, the loaves and fishes were handed out, it said there were 5,000 men plus women and children. So, if you've got 5,000 men, generally you think, there's probably 5,000 women. And if you had uh, 10,000 men and women, well, how many children? It all depends, I guess. You know, uh, some people have no children, and some people have 10 children. More likely you had a number of children in those days. So how many people were in that crowd? Many were called. But then compared to the whole nation of Israel, mm, you know, there were many people many, many more people that weren't called. And compared to the whole world, that was a, a very small amount. So when it says many are called, we're comparing it to the number that end up being chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. Matthew 22, verse 14. Choosing if we say that if, if we look at being called as the first filter, then those who are called have to go through the second filter. The second filter is being chosen. The indication is, is, is that choice is being exercised among, from among those people whom God the Father has called. Who is exercising that choice? 
Well, we see that from the scriptures here in John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. <clears throat> Christ says there, from this time on. Now, up until this time, the implication was up until this time, the relationship was different. Henceforth, to these people that he's eating the Passover with, not to everybody, and there would be people, descendants of those people spiritually who followed afterwards, but not to everyone that came to listen to what he had to say. Henceforth, to those people he's uh, speaking to in the room where they're holding the Passover, I do not call you servants. Up until that point, the implication was he had called them servants. They were servants. And that's a high honor, isn't it? To be a servant, it is a high honor. And I sometimes say this to somebody who serves me in some way or the other. It might be somebody who's a servant, uh, somebody who's a, who's a waitress or a waiter in a restaurant, uh, or somebody who serves on an airline, you know, um, flight attendant. It could be a servant, uh, somebody who serves uh, in the barber shop cutting my hair, somebody who serves in, in a myriad number of ways. That's a very, it's a very high honor, isn't it? To be called a servant. Because Christ said, let the greatest among you be called a servant. So it's a high honor. But he says, from this point on, I got a, an even higher honor for you than being called a servant. Hereafter, I will not any longer call you servants. Because a servant, why? Here's, here's the difference between being only a servant, only a servant, and being what now... Um, these people are going to be called because the servant does not know what his Lord does. He's just taking instructions and following those instructions. He doesn't really have understanding of the concepts that are going in, into the, the, the instructions that he's receiving. And he doesn't, he doesn't, he's a servant, he doesn't call those things into question. Servant does not know what his Lord does. But hereafter, I call you friends. Christ calls you his friend. Now that's a lot more personal relationship than being called a servant. That's what he's saying. For all things. Here's why. Here's, here's where the you know, the transition was made. Here's where the, the uh, thing that was being looked at flipped around from being a servant to now being called a friend. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. Knowledge is, is a big part of that. But you, you can see here that Christ is exercising a choice. And in the next verse of scripture, he points that out. <clears throat> verse 16, you have not chosen me. There wasn't even probably an option for them to have chosen him. But, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit that your, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So he's saying, I've chosen you. You're my friend now. I've revealed to you all of the things that that change our relationship to one of master-servant to friends. Effectively, we don't have, you know, going back to the scripture here, 
They that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Effectively, we don't have <clears throat> any control at all over our calling, over whether or not we are called. That just is in the hands strictly of God the Father, not even Christ himself. <coughs> and uh, we don't have a lot of control. I would, I, would, I would think maybe we have some control over where, whether, we are, whether or not we are chosen. Christ chooses us, but I'm sure he's choosing us based on our response to the calling that God the Father has made to us. But still, that's more in the, in the control of Christ himself to choose us than something that we can ourselves um, be in control of. So the question is, once we've been called and chosen, is it then a, we say, done deal? Is it a done deal? Now we've been called and chosen. We come here and uh, we attend services and we keep the Sabbath. Is it a done deal? No, well, it says those that are with him are called and chosen, yes, but there's this other thing. And I would submit to you we have a lot of control over this other thing. Being faithful. And in fact, I would say that all depends on us. Being faithful. If we're going to be with him at his uh, return, those that are with him are called, it says in Revelation, called, chosen, and faithful. Now God the Father and Jesus Christ are going to both be involved in our lives, assisting us, maybe prodding us, helping us in one way or another to remain faithful. It is somewhat, as, as the sermonette uh, implied, a distance race that we have to negotiate for the rest of our lives, being faithful. And I made that distinction between faith, having faith, understanding that God exists, that's a concept that we have in our minds. But then being faithful involves, as Bryant said, the doing of many things over a long period of time. That's the third filter. You know, we've got one filter, which is being called. Second filter, we've got to get, go through that one as well, being chosen. Now almost everybody's left behind by those two filters. And here's the third filter. Hopefully we all, or most all of us, will get through this third filter. First filter is blocking out the, the great majority of the world. The second filter, at least temporarily, it's not permanent, but it's at least temporarily, that's what happened. The second filter, as the Bible says, many are called and few are chosen. We're much more responsible for being faithful. This one thing remains for us. And this is where I'll get into the three things. These are the three things that I'm talking about in this sermon. Three things that the Bible tells us that we need to do in order to be considered faithful. Micah chapter 6. <clears throat> There's quite a bit of, of scripture here that is uh, pretty interesting, but it takes a little bit of analysis to understand it well. Hear you now, says in Micah, what the Lord says. Arise, contend before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Now the implication that I read into this is, um, there's a, a little bit of unhappiness with God. He says, all right, stand up here. Let's, let's hear what you've got to say about me that you aren't happy about. Hear you, old mountains, the Lord's controversy, 
and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people. Now we can read that in two ways, can't we? We can read it as God has a controversy with the physical descendants of the people of Israel. And I guess we could look at this whole nation, you know, the British Commonwealth of Nations, the uh, people who descended in various places of the world from the man Israel. They would say he has a controversy with his people. Yes, that's physical Israel. And we can clearly see that, that uh, controversy, but it's also implying that there's a controversy with spiritual Israel. And he will plead with Israel. Verse 3. O my people, what have I done unto you? And wherein have I wearied you? Testify against me. <laughs> God's inviting a testimony against him by, I guess, physical Israel. I don't think they're going to get it. They're not, <clears throat> at least at this, in this age, they're not really going to understand <clears throat> the idea of testifying against God. They don't, at this point, by and large, they don't really even get the concept of God at all. <clears throat> but it's sort of like, okay, you come up to the witness stand, put your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand, and repeat after me, testify against me. That kind of... You know, not that we would do that, but that, that kind of um, testimony is what's being talked about here. Testify against me. Bring forth your accu accusations against me, in other words. He says, uh, I, I'd, like to, I'd, like to, I'd like for you to remember this when you do it. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Did he bring you up out of the land of Egypt? He did. He did. He brought me up out of the land of Egypt. I was part and parcel with the world. And the Bible likens this world to the land of Egypt. And I redeem you out of the house, it says, of servants. Interesting word since we talked about servants before. No longer servants, but now friends. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, Moab, consulted and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal. I want you to remember that so that, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm inserting the word so that, remember it so that what you may know the righteousness of the Lord. What was to remember? That's the first part of, I think, of the thing that's interesting about this scripture. It says, remember Balaam and Balak. Well, what is there to remember from Balaam and Balak? Hmm? Balak wanted Israel cursed. And so he sent and brought this uh, modern, I mean, at the time it would be like a modern day seer, somebody who could, uh, who was involved in witchcraft or those kinds of things, but had spiritual knowledge and power. So he sent for, for Balaam because he wanted, he was going to pay Balaam to curse Israel. He wanted the nation of Israel cursed. He said, remember that. That um, Balak sent for Balaam to come down here and curse you. Did I allow them to did I allow him to curse you? No, he didn't. God said that Balaam cannot curse Israel. And Balaam knew he couldn't curse Israel. He and so what did Balaam do? He told because he wanted the he wanted the reward he wanted the money he wanted the payment for having cursed Israel he told Balak I can't curse them but here's what you can do you can get them to curse themselves 
How do you get them to curse themselves, entice them to disobey God? And if they disobey God, because of the righteousness of God, they will no longer be acceptable to God. They will be cursed. Because he's saying here, no, understand my righteousness. I have a, a standard of righteousness which I cannot compromise. And if you don't live up to that standard of righteousness, you will be cursed. Remember, Balak, Balaam, so that. Here's the reason why you remember that. So that you will understand the righteousness of the Lord. Verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Okay, my righteousness, it's, this is relating to his righteousness. Understand my righteousness and how can you obtain redemption? Because we're not really capable of the standard of righteousness that God requires, is, are we? And so what do we do about that? What is to be done about it? Burnt offerings. You bring, uh, I guess I don't know how old it was, but uh, we got, a, we got uh, I guess, a whole animal we divided between the Lamberts and the Holloways, a calf, uh, maybe a year old. And uh, we put beef in the refrigerator for the coming year. Shall, and that, so that represents a pretty good uh, financial commitment, doesn't it? I think I read, uh, I saw in the news that beef is up 14% from the year before. So it was quite a financial commitment to get a whole animal like that, have it butchered and put it in the freezer and plan to have meat for the coming year. Here's the question. So you see, that when you see that as a financial commitment, am I going to be happy? Shall... I come before God with burnt offerings. If I take all of this uh, financially, the amount of money that would require from one of these animals, if I took the animal down and I had it burned at the temple, you know, sort of allegorically, uh, is that going to be what God wants? Verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands, thousands now, of rams, or with ten thousands, listen to this now, <laughs> this is sort of growing in magnitude as we go, isn't it? From a bull, or you know, a, a beef animal, to thousands of rams, and then going even higher, ten thousand rivers, rivers of oil. What's enough? What's enough to satisfy the requirements of righteousness? <clears throat> I, I hesitate to mention this in front of Bryant, but this next phrase, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Can I pay for myself the sins which I have committed, it's a rhetorical question, isn't it? And the answer to rhetorical questions, they answer themselves. A rhetorical question answers itself, doesn't it? No. None of those things are sufficient because, it, what does it say back above there? Understand the righteousness. I want you to understand my righteousness. None of these things are sufficient to do the job. Verse 8. And this is where I get the three things 
that for in order for us to be considered faithful, here's the three things that we must master. He showed you, old man, what is good. So, I mean, that, that makes an enormous statement, doesn't it? He's already compared it to something that is impossibly beyond any human being to accomplish. You know, first of all, bulls, then 10,000 rams, and then 10,000 rivers of oil. They're not sufficient. He has showed you, old man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? And here are the three things that we're focusing on. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Those three things. Just three small things. That's what God requires of you if you're going to be considered faithful. Now you may have faith, as we said, that's concept. And, um, you know, it's important. Not saying it, not diminishing that at all. Because it says without faith it's impossible to please God. Those who come to Him must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. But this is about running that race, that distance race, the endurance to get from where you are when you are called to the finish line to the finish line these three not so small things do justly love mercy walk humbly with your God the implication is that you cannot in these three things be a failure and be among those who are called chosen and faithful because these three things are required if you're going to be considered faithful. And that's what we want to be on the Day of Trumpets. Let's look for a little bit at doing justly. One of the things I'd like to point out here is we are in a verb progression. We're in three verbs here. Three different verbs. Do justly. Do is the verb. Brian talked about doing during the sermonette. He must have been knowing what I was going to speak of or think about or something. Do justly. Something we have to do. Second thing is love, mercy. Love is not a physical action that we can take, is it? It's really a state of mind. Something our attitude should be reflecting, something that should be controlling our attitude toward mercy, loving mercy. And then the third thing is walking. So do, love, and walk. <clears throat> and we want to do these things otherwise you know, God is not going to allow somebody else to curse us but we can and this is what we're, we're thinking about and considering we could curse ourselves by not doing these things if we're going to be considered faithful we have to do these things because he talked about here Remember Balaam and Balak and understand my righteousness. Do these three things. Doing justly. It's, it's actions that we have to take. What does it mean to do justly? We know what it means to do. To do is an, an act of physical action in some way. Do justly. Justly. Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 19 and read uh, four verses of Scripture there. I won't, I won't dwell on it too long because uh, I'm sure you're quite familiar with these verses of Scripture. One came and said to him, 
Good master, what good thing shall I do? Do justly. What good thing shall I do? You find that word popping up here in this verse of scripture as well. That I might inherit eternal life. Christ said to him, why do you call me good? There's none good but one. If you will enter into life, this is what you need to do. Do justly. Keep the commandments. That's in large measure what it means. It's not, it's not entirely comprehensively everything, but it is in large measure what it means to do justly. And he goes through the litany of some of the commandments there. Honor your father and mother, verse 19. Love your neighbor as yourself. He has showed you, O man, what is good. Back to Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly? Love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Here's one of the big problems with that, of course. Mankind wants to define for himself the difference between good and evil. And in his decisions, insofar as he does not accept the definitions of God about good and evil, then how can he do justly? And that's a, that's a problem for us. If we accept the definitions and the wisdom of the world about the difference between good and evil, we'll be diverted from the path of doing justly. Only God has the right to define good and evil. And I put down here Genesis chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. I won't go to those. But only God has the right to define good and evil. And you'll see there the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as well as the tree of life. But the world has, uh, you know, its own definition of of good and evil. You know, Hitler had his definition of what was good. Hitler was bringing about, at least in his own perverted mind, the kingdom of God, and he knew how to do that, as far as he was concerned. Stalin, he was bringing about utopia. Again, in a, in a perverted, probably both of them were demon-possessed uh, or demon-influenced people. Um, they thought that if they took certain actions, eliminated certain bad influences in the society, that they would be able to bring about, ultimately, a utopia. There are many, many people, even when you get down to the local level, who as well define good and evil. We had an individual that we ran into conflict with by the name of Craig Benedict. And uh, when I first uh, heard of Craig Benedict, he was a U.S. prosecutor in Syracuse. And uh, attorney there, who became a federal judge subsequently, said, uh, well, what you have to understand about these people is they believe that the ends justify the means. So he was saying to me that they think they can break the law themselves, including especially the law of God, which they don't respect at all anyway, <clears throat> as long as it suits the purposes that they have of um, making, they've already made a judgment about you. <clears throat> and they're not going to be subverted from executing the judgment that they've made about you. Subsequently, he wrote a, uh, a very profane letter threatening, at the time, Jim Todd, who worked for our company. And uh, I saw that letter. It was not something I would have 
written to anybody, let alone, let alone, uh, you know, in a position as a as a federal prosecutor. So I I told Tom Smith, who was a an attorney at the time who was involved in the case, I said, Craig Benedict is a profane bully. Tom Smith said, well, might be right about that, but I want to, I want to say this in Craig's defense. Craig is a profane bully who sincerely believes that he is right. So I said to Tom, Hitler believed he was right. Sincerely believed he was right. Six million Jews are dead. Who do we blame for that? The other end of the phone was silent for a long time. And he said, well, I guess that's just about the best I've ever heard it put. So, I mean, being sincerely convinced of something doesn't mean that we can then violate the law of God. We have to do justly according to God's standards. And God's standards are the key to all of that. We have to first of all know what those standards are, accept those standards, reject the standards of the world, and then we are in a position to do justly. That's the first of the three, do justly. If we're gonna be faithful, if we're not gonna curse ourselves, we have to do justly. Second one is love mercy. Love mercy, again, the three progressive verbs. This is also a requirement so that we will not curse ourselves as Balaam said to Balaam, just get, just get them to do these things and curse themselves. Because I can't curse them. I, I, nobody can curse them. God has blessed them, so I cannot curse them. But you can get them to curse themselves. Here we are. That's where we sit. That's what's being said in Amos. Love mercy, that's the second verb, love. And love what? The object of the verb is mercy. Love is an attitude of heart. Love is motivational. Love controls how we feel about the object of that verb, mercy. I thought about an example of love and, it, and, I, and, I, and I bring this example up because it should be what our attitude, it should reflect what our attitude is toward mercy and that is Jacob's love for Rachel. You know? <laughs> Jacob uh, fell in love with Rachel, fell in but uh, you know he, he loved Rachel. And so he wanted to marry Rachel. He made a deal with Rachel's father. I didn't get this deal from Ron whenever he married Lori. Maybe I should have tried to get seven years of service. <laughs> <clears throat> Jacob made a deal with Rachel's father. Seven years of service so that he could marry Rachel. And he didn't get Rachel on the front end of that deal either. It was after seven years of his life he dedicated to that uh, objective to marry Rachel. That was, that's a reflection of love. I'm using that as an example of the fact that our attitude toward mercy should be similar to Jacob's attitude toward Rachel. Jacob served Genesis chapter 29 verse 20 seven years for Rachel and he was so enamored with her he cared so much about her he was so 
captivated by her that they seemed to him as a few days. Only a few days. And it, then prepositional phrase follows that because of the love he had for her. Seven years. So Jacob said, all right, seven years are up. Now it's time for us to be married. Laban tricked him and, and gave him Leah. Jacob went back for another seven years, 14 years, so that he could marry this woman. Now you women see how it can be with us men. You know, um, I don't know if I would have given 14 years for Hazel, but maybe seven. <laughs> Definitely seven. So it's Genesis 29, verses uh, 27 and 28. He gave another seven years. And so that's Jacob's attitude toward Rachel. It's a, an example of love. Love mercy. We must love mercy. Implication, if we don't love mercy, it's a requirement. What does the Lord require of you but? A requirement, right? Do justly. Love mercy. That's the second requirement. If we don't love mercy in the way that we should, we won't be fitted, we won't be fitting for the position that God has for his leaders in the kingdom. Love mercy. The word in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, love mercy is kesed. K-H-E-H-S-E-D. That's love. Translated as love. And um, it has to do with favor, good deeds, loving, kindness, merciful, having pity, reproach, reproach to wicked things. Loving mercy. And so that is the second thing that is required of us. It's a requirement if we're going to be considered faithful. Doing justly is a requirement if we're going to be considered faithful. We must be considered faithful if we're going to be in the position that we want to be in when the day of trumpets is fulfilled. Third thing is to walk humbly. So number one is do, number two is love, number three is walk. How do we think about walking humbly? I, I, I just had an example pop into my mind this morning while I was looking at this. Back in the 1960s, late 1960s, we went to a football game in Knoxville, Tennessee. Georgia Tech, I went to Georgia Tech. They were playing in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we went up there. Knoxville's kind of famous for uh, people from the hills coming down to the football game. Well, there was a, diff there a different culture among a lot of those people in the hills. And um, we went down there. There's this one individual. He's coming, he's coming down the pathway. He's got a, about this long, a replica of a spark plug. And he's got this spark plug slung over his shoulder. He's walking along. I've got Tech's big spark. You know, Tech was a rambling wreck. Automobile was there, or, you know, an ancient automobile who <clears throat> was the uh, symbol that they took, the mascot that they took because of technical school, engineering and building things and so forth. Well, they had this... Uh, this uh, Model T Ford that they took everywhere they went. It was a catch me out. They had that thing polished and, and it was in really, really meticulous shape. And so he's walking along as a, he's got the big spark of tech. <laughs> Without the spark plug, they're not gonna get anywhere. They're not gonna beat Tennessee in the football game. That was the implication. So he's walking along like that. He's pretty proud. And, and about three or four steps behind him, 
there's this woman. She's walking along. Every time he takes a step, she takes a step. Every time he stops, she stops and waits behind him. I understand. She's, she is his wife. And she's walking humbly. Now, if, if, if a human being ever walked humbly behind, you know, another human being, this woman is walking humbly behind her husband. I'm not recommending that. If Hazel wants to do it, it's okay. But uh, this is not, <clears throat> the comparison is that we are to walk humbly with God. Now, maybe that's a good Maybe that's a good demonstration of how we are to walk with God, not how we're to walk with other human beings, but we are to walk with God where he leads. What does the Lord require? Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God thought about this in regard to this as well the hymn where he leads me I will follow where God leads me I will follow and you know what as I read the scriptures as I read the prophecies God is probably going to lead us into some pretty difficult circumstances and yet he wants us there is it partly to test us I'm, I'm, I'm confident that it is, but it's also <clears throat> um, because he wants us to show forth to the rest of the world what needs to be done, using us as an example of how he is to be followed, even in the difficult circumstances. As they won't do it, they still see us doing it as an example. Here's some of the things I thought about. Where God leads us will require humility. Walk humbly with your God. How to walk with your God. It is a, an adverb which describes the walk. Walk humbly with your God. Where God leads, we will follow. You won't find necessarily all these things in doing justly. You won't find all of these things in loving mercy. This is um, like a, a third category, walking humbly wherever God leads us. There's some scriptures that indicate that, a couple of them. Revelation chapter 18. Another angel came down from heaven, having great power. The earth was lightened with his glory, cried mightily with a voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen, become the habitation of devils, and every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. All nations have drunk of the wine of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. This is the world that we live in being described. <coughs> Here's what is being told to us and it will be increasingly said to us and if we're going to walk humbly with God then we're going to have to do this. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. I'm sure that in many ways we'd rather just stay part and parcel of the world. But it says, Come out. This is a description. This is what God is saying to do. Follow me. Walk humbly in the direction that I have led you. You're going to have to do this. You're going to be considered faithful. Come out of this world.
Here's an example I thought of too, Noah. Noah had to completely come out of the world, didn't he? I mean, the whole world perished. And we sort of think of Noah in a maybe uh, kind of a magical, uh, adventurous way, like uh, some great movie production and how, how nice it would have been if we could be Noah. I can just only imagine that the weariness and of heart and the difficulty that Noah had as a result of walking humbly where God led him. You know, I mean, he saw the whole world, he and his family, not just him, but his whole family, saw the whole world perish. Saw every other living human being dead. What a great burden that must have been to live through. But he walked humbly with God. Now that's part of, the, part of the testimony of Noah, isn't it? He walked humbly with God. God told him to do something. He did it. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 23. Every living substance. Can you imagine living through that? Can you imagine how that would affect you? It's not romantic. It's not a romantic thing that Noah went through and lived through. But he had to do it in order to be faithful, following God. Every living substance was destroyed, which is upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, the creeping things, the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Well, it's not so easy necessarily to walk humbly with God. Three things. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Here's the conclusion. We're in an endurance race. We're looking for the coming of the return of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a difficult situation for us as well. Something like, although lesser in magnitude by far, than what Noah you know, experienced. <clears throat> we can be judged faithful, I would say if and only if, although God knows we're not going to be perfect in it, and he has extended for us the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so that we can be forgiven. And where we fail, if we seek, forgive, seek that forgiveness, then he'll grant it to us. We can be judged faithful if and only if we do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. If we do that, we can be faithful and we can remain faithful and be with Christ at his return. Here's the scripture <clears throat> that maybe we could focus our attention on as we conclude this sermon. Matthew 25 and verse 21. The word faithful is prominent in this scripture. The Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord.